Hi, welcome to Bookie, which unlocks big ideas from world bestsellers in audio, text, and mind map. Please download Bookie at Apple Store or Google Play with more features. Get your free mind snack now. Today we will unlock Sophie's World, a book which covers the history of Western philosophy. Do you remember the moment in your childhood when you gazed up at the stars for the first time? What sparked your curiosity about the universe? Have you ever felt confused about why people cannot fly? Why do different creatures exist? Why am I able to think? Have you ever felt astonished by being alive or that the world exists at all? Many people wonder about the point of our curiosity. What can philosophy do? It cannot provide you with lots of money or food. Philosophers are just a group of lazy bones individuals. They think about meaningless things endlessly and waste social resources. However, Garter believes that everyone is born with a natural curiosity about the world. But as people grow older and lead a progressively easy life, they become unwilling to learn about the world. Philosophers are those who embark on this dangerous journey once again. Some of them fall off, but many persist. They yell at the people who live easy lives for being too concerned with material matters. Ladies and gentlemen, we are floating in space. But no one cares. They may even refer to them ironically as a bunch of troublemakers. And continue on with their conversations. Would you pass the butter, please? How much have our stocks risen today? What is the price of tomatoes? Have you heard that Princess Diana is expecting again? Right, we have no idea. We often only care about things that do not matter at all and turn a blind eye to crucial events. So, as the book says, now you must choose. You can choose to become an indifferent person who has no feelings just like everyone else. Or you can choose to embrace a mindset full of curiosity and a thirst for knowledge. If the latter is your choice, Sophie's world will surprise and enlighten you. The author of this book Eustein Garter was originally a philosophy teacher in a senior high school. He was obsessed with thinking and exploring the nature of humanity as well as searching for the ultimate meaning of life. Since publishing his first book in 1986, he has gradually become known as a world-class writer in Norway. Sophie's World is a novel which presents the whole history of Western philosophy through the story of a philosophy tutor teaching a philosophy course to a girl named Sophie. Sophie means wisdom, and the original meaning of philosophy is to love wisdom. So this title is perfect for conveying the history of philosophy. This book is an excellent primer for people who have never learned philosophy. Now, please join us and start on your journey towards loving wisdom. First, we will start with what is philosophy and talk about the philosophical foundations of ancient Greece. Second, we're going to sort out the philosophical skeletons from the Middle Ages to the philosopher Kant. Finally, we will briefly discuss the era after Kant. The philosophy course began with the first letter from her philosophy tutor Alberto Knox. There was only one sentence in the letter, Who are you? When we first learn to talk and walk, we often ask ourselves, Who am I? Sophie also wondered, Is she Sophie? But who is this person named Sophie? What if she was given a different name such as Anne or Lillimer when she was born? Would she have been someone else? Sophie soon found that animals could not think about who am I. Humans meanwhile could not only realize the existence of themselves, but also think about where do I come from and where am I going. We can even think about whether there is a life after death or what is the meaning of life. This is quite unusual. Soon she received the second letter, where does the world come from? Sophie did not think she or anyone else really knew the answer, but it was worth asking. For the first time in her life she felt it wasn't right to live in the world without at least inquiring where it came from. We live in a modern society with advanced technology, and we therefore know that we live on a very small planet in space. But where does space come from? It is possible that space has always existed. But can anything have always existed? It must have a beginning, right? So space must have evolved from something else at some point. But where does that something else come from? The question seems similar to which one came first, the chicken or the egg? However, 
this is only deferring the question? At some point, there must have been something that came from nothing. But isn't that just as incredible as the view that the world has always existed? Who are you? Where does the world come from? What annoying questions! Sophie felt as though someone had jolted her out of her daily life and made her face these great riddles of the universe. In fact, these questions are exactly the questions that humans were thinking about when they first gazed up at the stars. They are also questions that you were thinking of when you were just a child. The reason why philosophy comes into being is because of humans' curiosity. Garter also believes that curiosity is the only precondition for making an outstanding philosopher. Just like its original meaning, philosophy is to love wisdom. To answer these questions, there were many myths in early human history. For example, in Nordic myths, people believed that it was Thor who made thunder, lightning, and rain, which brought fertility. Greek people also created numerous myths, including those of Zeus, Apollo, Athena, and Dionysus. The earliest Greek philosophers criticized these myths. They thought that these gods resembled humans and they seemed just as egoistic and treacherous as humans. Therefore, myths were nothing but the results of humans' imagination. From then on, people started to transition from a mythological mode of thought to one based on experience and reason. The aim of the early Greek philosophers was to find natural explanations for the changes of nature, instead of supernatural ones. These philosophers are known as natural philosophers. The book introduces several of the most important philosophers of this period. For instance, Parmenides thought that everything that existed in the world was everlasting and there was no actual change. Nothing could turn into anything else. The only real existence is oneness. Heraclitus disagreed with this idea. He proposed rather that everything flows. Following this, it was often said that we cannot step twice into the same river. He also pointed out that everything in the world is characterized by opposites. If we had never been hungry, we would not feel the pleasure of being full. If there was no war, we would not value peace. If there was no winter, we would not experience spring. Therefore, both good and bad, and both kind and evil are essential. The world would not exist without this constant interplay of opposites. This is also the initial origin of dialectics. Of course, the theories of Parmenides and Heraclitus are far more complicated than what we just talked about. But after reviewing their theories, we need to notice one detail. That is Parmenides did not think that our sensory perceptions were reliable. Nothing will change from the rational view. Contrary to this idea, Heraclitus thought that nature was changing constantly from the perspective of sensory perception. So who is right and who is wrong? Should we follow reason or our senses? During this period, as a whole, the views of Parmenides and Heraclitus did not exist as opposites to one another. But we can find that these two opposite views emerged from a long history of philosophy. Following the natural philosophers, Socrates presented the beginning of the history of philosophy. He was the most secretive person in the history of philosophy. He never left any written records, but he was one of the most influential people in European thought. All that we know about Socrates so far mainly comes from the writings of his student Plato. It is said that the oracle at Delphi showed that Socrates of all mortals was the wisest. Just as a Roman philosopher Cicero said, Socrates called philosophy down from the sky, established her in the towns, introduced her into homes and forced her to investigate life, ethics, good, and evil. Different from the sophists, Socrates thought that philosophers knew that their knowledge was very limited, so that they kept pursuing the truth. He said, one thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. So philosophers are those who realize that there are lots of things that they do not know, and they are bothered by this. Socrates considered himself to be a philosopher, which as we said at the beginning means one who loves wisdom. Socrates acted according to his thoughts. He never taught others like the sophists, but only raised questions and discussions. He spent most of his life chatting with people in the city squares and marketplaces in Athens. First, he asked questions as if he knew nothing. Then, in the discussion, 
he forced his opponent to admit the flaws of his theory and to discern right from wrong. This is spiritual midwifery, a metaphor that we often hear used. It might have been influenced by his mother who was a midwife. Socrates thought his dialogues were just like a midwife, because the true knowledge comes from the mind instead of others' instructions. Just as the ability to give birth is a natural characteristic, if we use our common sense and explore our inner heart, we will comprehend the truth of philosophy. Socrates constantly revealed the weakness of people's thoughts. This made some people think that talking with him was similar to making a fool of themselves in public. So more and more people began to see him as a gadfly, especially prominent people. Very soon after, he was accused of not believing in the accepted gods of Athens and corrupting the youth. He was convicted by the vote of a jury of 500 people, by only a narrow margin. In fact, he could have survived if he was willing to ask for a pardon or to leave Athens, but he instead chose to go to his death with dignity. Nowadays, many scholars believe that it makes more sense to think of Socrates as a philosophy himself, rather than a philosopher. He is more like the incarnation of philosophy. Throughout the history of philosophy, all philosophers have more or less regarded the wisdom and knowledge of philosophy as an instrument. But for Socrates, philosophy was a dialogue. In dialogue, people reveal and overcome contradictions in an effort to find the truth. He believed that the ability to distinguish right from wrong lay in people's reason. He also said, he who knows what good is will do good. No one could be happy if they act against their innate reason. His existence is the presentation of living wisdom without any modification. His martyrdom raised philosophy above life and death for the first time. After him, philosophy became a truly noble pursuit. Plato was only 29 years old when Socrates drank hemlock and died following his trial. He was hugely surprised to watch Athens condemn its noblest citizen to death. This incident had a great influence on his later philosophic course. To Plato, the death of Socrates proved that there was a conflict between the real society and the ideal society. Plato's first deed as a philosopher was to publish Socrates' plea to the jury in the form of the book Apology. Apart from the Apology, Plato is the reason why we have all these works of Socrates and Plato himself. Plato established a school of philosophy not far from Athens, which was named the Academy. Plato taught philosophy, mathematics, and gymnastics at the Academy, of course, also in the form of dialogues. Plato was concerned with the relationship between what is eternal and what flows. He was interested in eternal things related both to nature as well as human morals and society. The two problems are two sides of the same coin. He tried to grasp the immutable truth about individuals, and to draw people's attention to what is eternally true, eternally beautiful, and eternally good. Plato divided the world into the ideal world and the sensible world, as a kind of dualism. On this basis, Plato built up his theory of ideas. He thought that tangible things in nature flow, but the mold or form that makes these things is eternal and immutable. For instance, a particular horse or a man flows, but the universal behind them exists independently of complex sensible matters. They are both an eternal and perfect reality. All things and phenomena in the world are all replicas and shadows of the universal. What does this mean? For example, if we are going to make a horse-shaped cookie, we need a horse-shaped cookie cutter. This mold is the universal that Plato claimed existed. Through this mold, there are thousands of individual horses in the world. Therefore, it is impossible to truly understand constantly changing sensible matters. We can only have opinions or views on them. However, we can understand eternal, immutable and universal things, such as mathematics. Plato also supported mind-body dualism. He believed that man is a dual creature. Our body flows and belongs to the world of the senses, but we also have an immortal soul. This soul exists in the world of reason. Our souls originally existed. But as soon as they wake up in a human's body, they forget all their perfect ideas. When we find various forms of the same thing in nature, there will arise a longing to return to its true origin. This kind of yearning is known as eros, which means love. 
However, while this is the ideal course of life, most people are not willing to set the soul free from the body. They are only interested in daily duties and money. Of course, we hope that you won't be one of them. Plato used the myth of the cave to illustrate this. Imagine that people are living in a cave with their backs to the mouth of the cave and their hands and feet bound in place. Behind them are many human-like creatures passing by. These creatures hold torches which cast their shadows on the wall of the cave. For the people, these shadows depict what they believe to be the real world. One day, a cave dweller breaks his chains and finds that all he had seen before was merely shadows. He runs to the outside and finally sees the real world and its origin, the sun. Then he goes back and tells the people in the cave that what they thought was reality was actually shadows. However, people do not believe him. They point to the shadows and say that there is nothing else in the world. Then they kill him. The myth of the cave tries to illustrate the philosopher's road from shadows to the truth. Most likely for Plato, the man who went back and got killed was Socrates himself. In fact, not only were Plato's thoughts deeply connected with his teacher, they were also connected with his student Aristotle. Over the past 2000 years, Plato's thoughts have been constantly discussed and criticized by others. His student Aristotle was the one who started this trend. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. His works covered a wide range of fields, including topics ranging from physics, metaphysics, biology, poetry, music, logic, ethics, politics, and economics. Of course, this bookie cannot interpret all of them for you. We can only briefly introduce his theory of four causes. Aristotle admired Plato very much. But he also said, Plato is dear to me, but dearer still is truth. The book states that Plato emphasized the universal and was obsessed with ideas. Aristotle instead used his senses to study frogs, fish, anemones, poppies, and other objects that existed in reality. For this reason, he also holds an extremely significant status in the history of science. Aristotle thought that the ideas, form, and universal of things did not exist apart from things themselves, but existed in specific things. They were formed from thousands of particular things. The form was the characteristic of these things. So a chicken and the form of a chicken were indivisible, just like the body and mind. We have mentioned that Plato thought that things in the real world were just shadows of the universal or the soul. Aristotle held an opposite position. He believed that things in the soul were purely reflections of natural objects. The nature is the real world. He did not deny that humans were born with reason. But the reason is absolutely empty before we are able to sense things. So reality is made of various things that constitute a unity of substance and form. The substance here is the materials that make things. The form is everything's particular characteristics. In addition to the material cause and the formal cause, there are also the efficient cause and the final cause. The efficient cause is the driving force and cause to change things. The final cause is the reason why things exist or change, including purposeful action and activities. For the natural world, there is an original driver at the top. That is the final cause of all things that exist in the natural world. Okay, that concludes is the first section. Let's review what we've learned. First, we encouraged you to think about who am I and where does the world come from. Through thinking about these questions, we found that philosophy means to love wisdom. And the most important thing is curiosity. Next, we talked about some of man's original beliefs in order to answer questions about the world, including myths and natural philosophers. Then we introduced Socrates who was a martyr of philosophy, Plato who insisted that the universal and soul existed before natural things, and Aristotle who believed that nature was a reflection of the real world. We've covered all the foundations of Western philosophy that we know of. Now, let's build off them to reveal the magnificent world of philosophy's history together. Today we are just sharing limited content. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. Get your free mind snack now.